Okay, well, we're very excited now to have uh, Charlotte and Ella um, from Isika, Indigo Shire Youth uh, for Climate Action, join us at the YPPN to talk a bit about the experience of setting the group up um, and what their journey has been like, some of their successes, achievements and challenges as well. So um, it's really great to have you both here today. I will um, take my mic off and pass over to you now. Uh, feel free to share screen if you need to um, and give me a shout if you need me. Um, those that are in the call who might have questions for Ella and Charlotte, please feel free to use the chat box um, and then I'll jump back on at the end and um, we can have a bit of a chat and, and, and talk about um, any questions that have come through or any discussion points that might come up through your presentation. I'll pass over to you, thank you so much. Thanks so much for the introduction, Sam, um, and thanks for the opportunity of being here today. It's um, we're really grateful for it. Um, so my name's Charlotte. I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'll begin today by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm speaking from, and pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, so Izuka, which is Indigo Shire Youth for Climate Action is a climate action group based in Northeast Victoria that aims to educate and empower the youth to take climate action within our community by building their capacity and their connection with each other and various levels of government. It, it aims to provide a space that's not very easy to find in rural communities and was extremely important in helping individuals to feel connected and empowered, especially youth who often feel overwhelmed and isolated at the current state of the environment. Um, I personally feel that this is particularly important in places like Northeast Victoria, where people are particularly connected to their environment and therefore need to lead and educate themselves about climate change and how they want to deal with it. Um, I do have to apologise in advance. I'm actually at work at the moment, so if it gets a bit noisy in the background, I'm in the middle of a cafe, so sorry about that. Um, so my name's Ella. I also go by she, her pronouns. I'm very, very excited to be here. Um, Issaca was actually founded in mid-2020, like really at the start of the pandemic. It was initially to create an opportunity for young people to provide feedback on our Shire's draft um, for their climate emergency strategic action plan. So the council approached some young people in the community and said, we want to declare a climate emergency and we want to create an action plan. Can you please help us, um, help us do this in the best possible way we can for you guys? Um, so Isika ran a series of consultations with young people around the Shire and from these discussions made a number of recommendations to the council, all of which were adopted into the plan by Indigo Shire Council, which was really great to see. Um, their recommendations included mandating more youth and First Nations consultation in climate decision making process and supporting a youth climate summit, um, which we were happy to run. And we actually did successfully run at the end of last year. Um, and these were um, integrated into the council's final climate emergency plan. Um, after conducting the initial consultations and hearing all the ideas that young people had, we actually realised that there was a larger gap that needed to be filled in our community and that Issaca could have a long-term purpose. Um, so following these initial stages, Issaca continued to grow into a more permanent team, which is when Charlie and I joined after these consultations, after attending an event that Issaca ran and just felt extremely inspired by what the group was doing and we really wanted to play a part in that. And our primary goal of the organisation was to create, connect, educate and act. So they were our values that we really wanted to um, implement into the wider community. Um, we were extremely fortunate. We had a lot of support from regional bodies. And after supporting the DELP, which is the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning, after we helped the Hume region to run a couple of youth focused events, we were really lucky that DELP um, gave us a $50,000 grant and su to support our work over the past year and a half, 18 months. This enabled us much more than we would otherwise have done. And most of our activities since mid 2020 were under completed under this grant. So it allowed us to bring in professionals and access resources and do all sorts of things that we wouldn't have normally have been able to do. So we were very lucky to get that grant from, from Delp. Um, now I'll just talk about like the different events and things that we've run um, and a lot of it with the funding from Delp. So due to the constraints of the pandemic, the events over the past couple of years um, took place on Zoom. 
but this is actually a really good opportunity for us because so of us so many of us were not local and we were based all around the country so um, it was actually a really great opportunity um, and helped us to form our team um, so the first project that we did um, was our northeast climate series which entailed a number of virtual events on issues such as government engagement climate communications policy electoral processes and climate change and mental health um, a standout event was the Youth and Politics event, which is actually what um, made Ella and I want to join. That was at the end of last year. So it included a panel of political leaders from all three levels of government, including our MP, Helen Haynes, and provided a, a platform for them to answer questions asked by young community members about how to engage with local government. Um, and yeah, like I said before, I personally wasn't a member then, so we can't really take any of the credit for the things that happened. Um, but it was just such a great event um, and it really helped everyone to feel more, more connected to community. Um, we also ran some events on how to have tricky conversations about climate change, protect your mental health and an indie electorate pre-election event, all aimed at better equipping our youth on how to deal with the climate crisis. Yeah, and all of these online events were in conjunction with other groups and other, we found, um, networked with other organisations that we knew of and we emailed and we reached out. So we were really lucky to have the money to pay these people to come and speak um, as professionals. So they were really, they were really, really um, helpful events. Um, I'm going to speak about the Climate Summit, which was the original end goal for Issaacar, or not end goal, but a main goal for Issaacar when we began and we ran it, uh, when did we run it? December last year. So the Climate Summit was a major project. Um, it was the Northeast Youth Climate Summit. Um, it was a three day in-person summit that took place at the end of last year in Beechworth in Northeast Victoria in person. The event was run in partnership with local councils. Um, we had, I think maybe four or five local councils get on board, as well as Ausgreen, um, which we are also connected to, which is a global non-for-profit organization that runs youth leadership congresses across Australia and internationally. So we use their, we use Ausgreen's um, summit plan and kind of tailored it to what we were gonna need it for, for our region. Um, the, so we had a, took a special focus on climate change and the Issaca team, along with Green members, facilitated the program with, I think we had about 35 participants between the ages of, we had year sixes to year 12s basically, and we had about 35 from across the region. Um, the program began by educating participants and getting them to create vision, a vision for a sustainable future. And then we went into little groups and we did action planning for tangible solutions for them to achieve in their schools that ISA could then support in the future. Um, we shared these ideas with the public in a community forum and several of these action plans are actually still being worked on and it was really great to see the passion of young people um, as change makers within their own communities. So basically we spent the two days, the first two days really getting groups together and talking about and discussing what is climate change in the Northeast? What does it look like for us today? And what are ways that we can sort of make action in our schools or in our community? Um, and then the kids, like we had lots of little stalls and we invited lots of um, people from the community. We had mayors and we had counselors. We had um, really, you know, members of influential members of the community come and listen to the kids as they spoke about what they wanted to see in their schools. Um, one of the most, the, so I think one of the most powerful parts of the summit was the community forum, as it really helped you feel empowered to interact with members of council and older, you know, older people in the community um, and feel as though their ideas were valid and listened to. It was a really powerful three days. It was a lot of work, but it was definitely, um, really important and I was really really proud at the end of it I have actually got some pictures of the summit that I can share in a moment once we've finished talking and it's yeah it was a huge achievement um so the main takeaways that we got from the climate summit and the different events that we've run are that like are the connections that they facilitated between youth around the region I feel like that was kind of the most important thing that Isika did um, in rural communities in particular, I kind of talked about this before, but climate change often feels incredibly daunting and isolating. And I feel like um, it's a bit easier in the city to 
obviously because there's so many more people and lots of different groups and things that you can join it's easier to feel connected in it so we felt that it was important to try and create a space like that um, in rural Victoria um, so another thing that they achieved we hope um, was helping youth to feel more comfortable in interacting with people in positions of power um, and within like the council and levels of government within the community um, because it can be really daunting and like an inaccessible process talking to people um, like talking to the older people in positions of power um, and as a young person so it's crucial that the youth are made to feel that their voices are wanted and valued so I personally think that the most valuable thing that other people did to help Easy Car was facilitate that for us and make us feel wanted and empowered within the community and local government. Um, we found that most young people already have the ideas and the passion to create social change. They just lack the feelings to be, they lack feelings of support um, and agency and like they can actually take that step and start the change. Um, so that was like the most important thing to us is just the ideas are there and you kind of just need to um, listen to them and young people will do so many things. <laughs> Yeah, um, so this, these are all the lessons that we've well learned, but unfortunately, over the last few months, the challenges we've faced have become too overwhelming and we've made the decision to disband the organisation for now, so we've finished up. Um, we, it has been very difficult, uh, despite all of these achievements, running a volunteer organisation is very difficult, as I'm sure all of you are very aware of, it is difficult. And the main challenges to the longevity of the group was became more pronounced at the end, but were things that we were faced the entire like lifespan of the organization. And it was engagement and capacity. So basically with engagement, even as youth, we really struggled to engage with other youth. Um, so while there were some passion, there was passionate youth in the region, being the first group of our kind, we found incredibly difficult to get enough interest and participation in our events. Um, because sometimes it was hard to sort of reach those people that didn't even really know we existed, I suppose. Um, and this is something we found really perplexing because even our friends that we were reaching out to often didn't want to come to our events. Um, and so we really were a group of youth struggling to figure out how to engage with youth. And we really never found a solution to this. Um, so while there was a lot of passion and ideas about climate change, young people, you know, have, have so much things going on that it's often hard for them to find time to, or want to give their time, I suppose, and prioritise it. Um, and this was exacerbated as the world opened up again. And we had to run, we still had to run events online um, because all the team members lived in different places, but no one wanted to come to online events anymore. So that was something that we found really challenging. And that sort of leads into our second um, challenge, which really was capacity. So we are a team of about, we started off as a team of maybe five or six, and now we're down to three or four of us um, because we're just, you know, a few young people that really feel passionate about this, but we're all full-time new students or doing work for government or, you know, so we're all, even though we're all from the Indigo Shire, we're most recently graduated high school and moved away from the area to work and go to uni. So I'm living in Canberra. We had a few people in Melbourne. Um, and so while this was fine during COVID when everyone was at home anyway, it became a real challenge more recently when things were coming back into person and we had no members in the physical community and we couldn't run events in the physical community as easily. Um, and also Isika is a lot of work. It takes us, uh, you know, quite a few hours in the week to keep on top of emails. And so Sam is like, we're not great at getting back to emails sometimes because we are full-time uni students and we just, it's just, it is a lot of work. And as the team dwindled down and we weren't getting a lot more engagement, it became too overwhelming for the three of us to keep on top of everything. Um, so we just didn't have the time and we didn't have the, the engagement and on top of that our recent DELP grant has run out we spent all the money which is a huge achievement I'm so proud that we were able to spend $50,000 on climate action but we have run out and so resourcing and fundraising would be difficult if we were all living away um, so we've just made the decision that the longevity of the group is unsustainable and we've had to disband which is a disappointment but it's also a huge achievement because we have learned some really valuable lessons and I'm really proud of the fact that we were able to run you know, the climate series and we were able to run 
a three-day summit and spend $50,000. It was, it was a huge achievement, but we have made the decision to, yeah, disband organization for now. But yeah, so that's sort of all we have to say about ISA cars. Yeah. Sorry, we went a little over um, the, yeah. the time as well, guys. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for the opportunity to present. It's, yeah, it's a really awesome opportunity. So thank you so much. Thank you both. Um, and just like, well done to have achieved all of that over the last couple of years is really not a small feat. Like it is a huge, huge feat. Like everybody on this call knows the challenges of connecting with each other, with their teams, uh, connecting with young people, navigating um, the restrictions, the ever-changing restrictions, the yo-yoing in and out of lockdowns, like running events over the last couple of years has been really, really hard. Like Yakvik have run, we tried to run things in person, we ran things online, we did manage to run something in person, but each of those events felt really, really big, like a really big deal. So for for you to have achieved that summit just is absolutely phenomenal. I really can't stress that enough. Um, and it's very impressive to hear how you, you know, came in with such excitement and motivation and, and turned that into something really tangible. And as you say, working closely with Delp and having great funding to be able to actually deliver on some of your ideas was, you know, a real dream come true, I guess. Um, but it isn't, it isn't something to, um, yeah, it isn't something to feel ashamed about that, you know, it's not, at the moment, it feels like it's not feasible to keep, keep going. But um, I guess the one thing I would urge is just to, to, to not necessarily call it the end, because there's the potential that potentially other young people maybe might be interested in picking it up at some point. I've actually heard rumours from DELP themselves that there's future funding. In fact, some of the work that we're doing with Delph at the moment, we're partnering with them on a couple of projects. And one of them is about um, speaking with young people about biodiversity and they're interested in looking at getting feedback from young people on what the, some future grants could look like. Um, so it may not be you, it may not work for you going forward, but it may be that there's other young people that could step into it. So the legacy that you've created could potentially continue in a new format, I guess. Um, but yeah, the other thing I just wanted to comment on was just that kind of how much it stood out, the simplicity, but the impact of um, connection, education and action. I just think that there's such great right, like principles from, from which you worked. Um, and it really reminded me about creating the really simple goals that you're looking to create through your projects um so yeah massive thank you for coming along today and, and sharing what you've been working on um there's comments in the chat box that hopefully you've been able to see a little bit there um I'm not sure if any of them are particularly questions i can see um, the first one's a quick question yeah. um about the action in schools and i'll just quickly say that the we had the schools we had um compost bins putting more bins in schools we had a group, a high school wanting to run an Indigenous or First Nations um, like awareness festival, like bringing in local First Nations people to um, just educate high schoolers on culture and things like that. We had we had two amazing year nine girls that had already started something but didn't have the way to keep going. They now go around to primary schools and get primary schoolers to write letters to their prime minister about climate change. And then they've recently just met with Helen Haynes in Canberra. So ASICA's managed to use our grant money to support Charlie and Edie in their quest to do that. Um, so we've had, we had some incredible projects come out of the summit. So that was mostly what we, it was all different. And basically we said to the, these students, think of whatever you can and we will try and fit it to what we can do for you. So we had a range of things, but a lot of, you know, composting and days, education days, and of course, Charlie and Edie, so yeah. Yeah, awesome. Um, I've got a quick question. Um, if anyone else has got a question, feel free to um, put it in the chat box or raise your hand through the reactions buttons. Um, my quick question was most of the people on this call are, are older people working in organisations that are not youth led, but really are passionate about supporting initiatives that are as youth led as they can be. And I wondered if you just had any kind of 
if there are any tips or ideas that you might have of things that really worked for you. I'm guessing, you know, you, you mentioned you worked a lot in partnership with other councils and, and other organizations. Is there anything there from what those groups did that really stood out to you as, as being really meaningful or really helpful? Um, the main thing that stands out to me is when we had a politics event, um, the members that we had come were so great and like our local um, member, Helen Haynes, I just remember her talking and saying how much like youth were valued in the community and how much she wanted to hear what we had to say and like how there was nothing like any idea that we had they wanted to hear about it and she was always there for us to talk to and like that was that was her job and that was like why she was there and I think just having um youth told that like their voices are valued and like wanted within the community is probably the the most powerful thing for me that I found yeah yeah and I mean through the lessons that I've learned in conjunction with other organizations I think the best way to engage with youth and obviously it's difficult because we weren't able to do it but for me personally I really enjoy or I think it's important when an organization makes it clear that there's a certain spot for you instead of inviting youth to come along if they would like there's a designated you've got a designated air like position or um, invitation for youth to come and speak and I think a lot of organisations say that they want to work with youth, but they sort of um, want us to say a certain way or just want us to speak, but not necessarily, we don't have full agency. So I think having a designated position for you, this is what we want you to say something. What do you want to say? And we'll listen to you. And I'm making that space really open and inclusive, I think is something that I have really valued when people have invited Issaka to events and said, we've invited you, um, at, just as you guys have done here, you know, really engaging with us personally rather than ticking a box, mm. I suppose, is the yeah. something that I found really important. Yeah, awesome. And is there anything that you wish anybody had done or had been able to offer or support you with? Like it sounds like the engagement piece was probably the biggest challenge if that had been a mm. bit more sort of, you know, stronger or successful or whatever you want to call it. it you might, have been, you might be in a slightly different position now. Yeah, for sure. Um, I feel like it's hard kind of to answer because we, um, when we were running, we were kind of doing more than we could at the time. So there wasn't really much room to think about other things. So um, yeah, nothing really comes to mind to me at the moment. I feel like everyone was pretty um, super helpful, but cheers yeah. to have. They're, they're, people were helpful, but people were also really, I found that sometimes when we got in contact with people, or even schools especially, really willing to say that they wanted us to be involved or saying that we're doing a great job, but there was not a lot of tangible support. Like we didn't, I, a lot of, um, you know, there were a lot of people that never we would get in contact with and say, yeah, that's a great idea. We'd love to get in contact with you and never reply to our emails. Or, and I suppose you get that a lot, but I think there was people, adults especially, love to say that they would love to help the youth organisation, but it is extra time and it's an extra thing that they have to do. And so sometimes I wish people had maybe given us a little bit more legitimacy. We were an organisation. We were trying to run events. We weren't just trying to look good and feel good. We were trying to make change. And sometimes I don't think we were given that autonomy but you know like on the whole everyone was really willing the councils especially were really willing to help out and other organizations we got in contact with mostly were also really willing to help out so yeah I don't have a lot to wish that had changed yeah yeah fantastic thank you so much for all of that like I, I hear yeah. a lot oh yeah Catherine yeah I have a question thank you so, well, firstly, I just want to congratulate the two of you, well, your team, actually, because that, that's pretty amazing that you're able to get all of that up and get all of that happening and get some really tangible results out of it in fairly short time over a pretty difficult, um, lot, uh, you know, environment. the whole world was crazy through those times. And, and you know, $50,000 is a fair lot of money. It's a great that you got that grant, but, you know, you achieved a lot with it. So, well done. The other thing I want to say well done is choosing to stop because it is actually a really hard decision to make. And I've seen a lot of organisations over the years just kind of keep limping along um, because no one's got the courage to say, you know what, this is not working and we need to stop and go and put our energy into something else. So well done for making brave decisions as well. Um, but I do, I do agree with Sam's comment about, like, don't lock it down and hide it away because there may be time for it to be rejuvenated. Um, the question I have for you 
is, do you think something like what you've done could work at a statewide level if it was supported by an organisation like YACTI? Or do you think the fact that it was really local to Indigo Shire actually was a key feature of why it actually worked into here? Um, you go, Charlie. <laughs> I actually think it would work better at a state level. I think it was almost a disadvantage having it at so, so, um, I mean, I, Charlotte might disagree with me, but personally, I thought having it at Indigo Shire often was a disadvantage because we couldn't even reach enough people. We were too rural um, in a way. And the people that we were bringing in to talk didn't know the Indigo Shire personally. So it really wasn't even that directed anyway. Um, so I think um, a statewide organisation like what we've done or something along the lines of this supported by an organisation like Yakvik would actually work really well. I think it would be something that you'd be able to reach more people. But Charlie, you might disagree with me. I don't know. No, I agree. And I think it would be easier to run events and get things going if it was statewide because then you'd be able to network and connect people so much easier. Um, I do think that like a a statewide policy would be good but I think it still needs to have that like community it needs to be specific to each community I think so I guess it would need to be like um I don't know how to explain it but there would also need to be like certain control within each area and community so that it could be really specific and actually make changes that they wanted to see and not just like generic ones yeah. for the state um but yeah, yeah I think that would yeah, I think that would be really effective. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Catherine. Sort of a, a joined up series of groups or something like that. But yeah, okay, great. Thanks for that. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm conscious of time, so we might wrap it up there. Thank you so much, um, Ella and Charlotte, and um, for giving up your time and talking us through the incredible adventure that you've had over the last couple of years. Um, and we'd really encourage you to stay in touch. If you're keen to stay involved in the network, that'd be great. Or if there's anyone you'd like to connect us with who might be, um, that would also be awesome. So I'm gonna cut the recording just there. Um,